All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Clint, and everyone for having me. And apologies to anyone who's been here longer than the 15 minutes I have. I was trying to get here earlier today, but uh, a lot of meetings. Uh, bring back travel, that's what I say. Uh, I like being in Florida in February. Anyway, so this is the topic of this talk is spirituality and the magic of playing drum kit. I'd like to start with a picture of me from this conference 12 years ago. Um, and here's an altered picture of the same picture um, from Carlos Xavier Rodriguez, who was manning the conference at the time. So the topic of my, my main research question at that point in life was how are drummers drummers and how do they learn to play? And I'm going to paint a kind of uh, or describe a brief journey from then to now following that research trajectory in my work. I was curious about the question, I drum, therefore I am. Uh, Yahoo showed this to me one day, when, back when people used to use Yahoo. It popped up. Uh, it had clearly been paying attention to the work I was doing. And I thought that's an interesting way of looking at identity and drummers. What might it mean to say, I drum, therefore I am? So I bought the t-shirt and various stickers and things and pursued this uh, through a study of identities. You can see that's the t-shirt I was wearing in the conference with the uh, I drum, therefore I am logo. I got one on my snare drum case. I named my first book the same thing because Ashgate let me. Um, and I was also wearing the I drum, therefore I am t-shirt. It became quite a thing. Um, Pam Bernard, University of Cambridge, asked me to come and give a talk about uh, I drum, therefore I am and what I thought that meant. And very politely, after listening to me rabbit on about uh, drumming and identity for a good hour and a half, she said, had I considered embodiment? Because from what I was saying and what I was describing and uh, my enthusiasm for drums and drummers, she thought perhaps I was interested in embodiment, which I hadn't come across before. And this sent me in a new direction. Uh, I later encountered the work of June Boyce Tillman, who mentions in one of her books, Descartes' Error. When he said, I think, therefore I am, uh, he was wrong. That's not true. That's not all there is to us. There's so much more. And uh, according to June and other thinkers, perhaps the whole of enlightenment, post-enlightenment thought has been based around this fallacious notion that we, we think, therefore we are. Um, so with that tied with the idea of embodiment got me quite excited. Uh, June Boyce Tillman has this model of spirituality, uh, which comprises uh, values, materials, construction, and expression. Um, and these things add up to uh, what she also says, liminality. Uh, she prefers spirituality with a capital S. And this was exciting to me too, because I'd sort of abandoned any notion of spirituality as in being involved with spirits, because I didn't believe in those really. But I did believe in expression, values, materials, and construction, and embodiment. Um, so this was sort of a new direction for me. And uh, tied to that, um, June Boyce Tillman says she avoided calling it aesthetic experience because of the kind of baggage that aesthetic experience carries in terms of music education literature. Um, but Richard Schusterman uh, cared less for that baggage and said these things, that aesthetic experience is essentially valuable and enjoyable in its essence, something vividly felt, subjectively savoured, affectively absorbing and focusing our attention on its immediate presence. I realise I'm reading out loud to people who can already read, so forgive me. Um, but it's meaningful experience, and it's not merely sensation. There's something meaningful about this experience, and it's at the core of what makes art, art. So this, and June Boyce Tillman's idea of spirituality, and the things I was reading about embodiment really sort of resonated, uh, pun intended, uh, with the research I was doing about drumming. Excuse me. June Boyce Tillman also hints at music being magic, uh, and I'm convinced it is because other people think so too. And I once wrote, we are the music, we drummers, we musicians, we embody the music. Music is a magical thing. Um, so, I, you know, it seems uncool in uh, academic circles often to, to talk about things that are sort of less rational. But there's something, there's something else that happens when, when we make music, in my experience and the experience of others whose work I've read. And I think it's worth exploring. Maybe it's magic, maybe it's spirituality, maybe it's liminality. You know, we sort of struggle for the right words sometimes, I think. Which brings me to my current uh, research question at Suncoast 12 years later. Why and how does playing drum kit matter to me? Um, I'm not quite sure why it would matter to anyone else. That might be for future research. I jest, that comes in the final slide. Um, so I've, I've said this before, that when I'm drumming, this feeling in my body and the conscious embodied knowledge that I am core to the band, creating and perpetuating the sound I hear and feel around me, compel me to continue making the music, making and luxuriating in the perpetual now. Uh, it's a little bit kind of poetic, maybe, for academic writing, but it's, um, I was really keen to try and pin down why it is that I like making music. 
um, as a teacher of other drummers, uh, which is a big part of what I've done as a professional, um, I was concerned that I wasn't necessarily always paying attention to this. The kind of, and this is one of the main reasons I think people like to make music, because it feels so good. Uh, and I was wondering where that might be in educational praxis. Um, I also wrote this once, that rock drumming for me is a particularly autotelic experience. Autotelic meaning valuable in itself and for itself. Um, because I'm a contrary kind of a guy, I then wrote, playing drums is not an autotelic pursuit, but a eudaimonic one. Uh, that was two years later after I'd done some more thinking. Um, because I thought, how can it be autotelic? I'm not drumming to drum. I'm drumming because of the way it makes me feel and the way I like the people I'm with and things. So it's more about fulfillment and thriving and eudaimonia than it is about autotelicism, <laughs> autotelicness. Um, so I play the drums not in order to play them, but because of the holistic eudaimonic fulfillment I derive from doing so. Um, so drumming provides me with doing something I know and can do, a place where I feel competent, confident, empowered and able to succeed. Not everything does that. Um, I like driving stick shift because it does something similar, but not quite as much. Um, there is maybe two or three things that do this, and drumming's the best. It provides me a transcendence and transformation of myself, taking me to another plane of existence, which I like. So I was reading, um, trying to sort of justify uh, doing any research at all on what I like and why I like it, and I came across um, a philosophical research on meaningfulness um, by Marissa Silverman and Susan Wolf and others, and uh, Harry Frankfurt, and came across this idea about self-love. And um, that got me worried because it sounds very selfish and I was brought up not to be very selfish. Um, but I learned, you learn from from, for example, that genuine love implies care, respect, responsibility and knowledge. And we are ourselves the object of our feelings and attitudes. And he says that my own self, one's own self, must be as much an object of my love as another person, which I thought was intriguing. Uh, maybe that's important. Maybe we should take care of ourselves and pay attention to the things that we like to do as a sort of, not necessarily a moral end, but maybe that's a good end, a meaningful end. And of course, uh, COVID happened and closed down any kind of music making. Uh, <laughs> well, not any kind, but the kind I like to do in a room with people. And it was thoroughly disappointing to spend uh, eight months. Well, the thing with, one of the things with, uh, with this pandemic and the lockdown, I suppose, was it's been, it's been kind of death by a thousand cuts, really, because first of all, it was just a couple of weeks. And then it was, oh, till the end of the month, and then maybe the spring semester, and then, oh, just through the summer, and then, and the fall. And now, now, now it's kind of like, oh, there's a vaccine, probably, maybe, sort of, but we're going to stay closed. And it's just been this kind of, nothing spectacular has happened in my life, fortunately, related to COVID. Um, I've been very fortunate. But it's just been this kind of endless stream of disappointments, you know, one, one after the other. Um, anyway, uh, that came to an end for me shortly in uh, November. I got an email um, through my website, which has never happened before. I didn't even know my website worked. But someone in a local band wanted to play original alternative rock music, and he sent me some kick-ass demos, one of which he'd written to a loop he'd downloaded from my website. So I was very interested in the enthusiasm of this gentleman. Um, so we got together in a local music store, which looks like this. The picture on the right is the rehearsal room. It's uh, unspectacular in every way, apart from the fact it's where we rehearse. So it's amazing. Um, and it has a great sound, actually. Uh, here's a picture of the three of us in the band, all masked and rehearsing. I'm the kind of blob you can't really see at the bottom there. Drummers at the back and all that, you know, keeping out of sight, out of mind. Um, but it was so good. It was so good after eight months of not playing any music live. Oh, my goodness. Uh, like I said, kind of death by a thousand cuts to sort of come back to life. This is roughly how I felt. Um, I love Bitmoji. It's, it's better at expressing myself than I am. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say that's exactly how I felt. It was so good. So um, I'd been trying to develop, uh, I'm not sure if it's a model, a diagram, some way to kind of understand the way that these ideas of righteous uh, or ethical self-love fixed with spirituality and Juice, Boy and Til Juice, yeah, Juice? June Boyce Tillman's model. Sorry, June. Um, and uh, with my ideas I had about identity, realizing identities, um, and how that's kind of, these things may all center on my love of drumming alone and with others, mostly with others, if I'm honest. So uh, I shan't go into any depth about this here, but I came up with a model of identity and learning. Uh, following the work of Lucy Green, I realized that these things are very similar. Identity and learning are entwined in multiple ways. Very briefly, I had the idea that there's sort of active 
uh, identity realization was you go about making your identity happen you kind of activate the you actively realize it was a passive realization is an understanding uh, and similar with learning you can sort of actively go about the process of learning in an active realization of the learning or you can understand something a sort of a aha which is a uh, the other side of realization anyway um so Thinking briefly about June's, June Boyce Tillman's spirituality, uh, with these four components she says are in it, um, in the band I'm in, in terms of her values, um, they're into punk rock. I say they, maybe it's a we now. It's a we. We're into punk rock. We share these values. Um, and I managed to... We've got a song called Fantastic, um, which is a fantastic song, uh, coincidentally. And um, it's a little bit about politics. So I managed to crowbar in an Eisenhower a uh, few seconds of Eisenhower talking about the military-industrial complex, and the others like it, which is a win. I've had to learn songs, learn the running order of the set, um, expressing myself. Drumming is who I am. And it's been very cool to uh, play with the materials. I've had to get some... I didn't have to. I chose to get some new technology and experiment with different setups and stuff, um, which has been fun. So checked all the boxes for June's spirituality, which is probably why it feels so good. Uh, here are some gratuitous pictures of me with different setups. I say gratuitous. It's core to the talk. Um, there's my regular drum kit there. Just on the left, there's a little uh, electronic box of nine pads that does clever kind of things. And I thought I'd better incorporate that. I've just been for a run, apparently, in that picture. Um, and here is the next iteration of the drum kit. Got rid of most of the drums and put the box in the middle there and tried to use it as a snare drum. And for some reason, my shoes are in that picture. Uh, but uh, this was not quite where I wanted it to be because it wasn't a real drum. And I like real drums. So then I tried this. And I had the little box off to the left there. It's turned on in this picture. And then I got my iPad. Uh, thanks, BU. With uh, an app that has all my backing tracks on it. And then more drums again, plus the electronics. Um, and different shoes in the bottom there. And then this is the, the current, maybe final, setup for the band, uh, for the drums anyway. So now I've got the pads on the right, the tracks are on the left, and I've got triggers. If you look closer, you can see a kind of silver and black thing on the snare drum. That's a trigger for the snare drum. So not only does it play that snare drum, but it plays another one at the same time. And I've got a trigger on the bass drum playing something cool as well, which is invisible here. And on top of the bass drum, there's that long black thing that plays other cool sounds. Um, I was very excited, and as you can tell, I still am about this. Um, so this is the logo for the band, which I also just got printed on a new bass drum head I felt I had to buy, because I had a white bass drum head, which wasn't any good. It needed to be black to match the, uh, no, the band logo. So um, the point of all this is it's been a very creative experience. I noticed creativity was the, uh, the, the conference topic, and this has been... Uh, a wonderfully creative time for me, and as I said, I feel very fortunate to have had these experiences during uh, during the pandemic, which has otherwise clouded our, all of our lives, I think. So, yeah, all of this has been very creative. Um, so what? Miles Davis has nothing to do with this apart from so what. I was going to sing you the bass line, but, you know, didn't. So here are some uh, some brief takeaways. I think it's important to facilitate teaching and learning experiences that matter to students. It's maybe that's maybe these all are a little obvious, but I, but I've, this was kind of a takeaway for me. Um, and I've I've not always done this, so I it, I try to try to do that um, because then we address learners more fully as humans and ideally help them to thrive. I think that's part of the same thing. Um, doing music together uh, is a vital part of being human. I'm not the first person to think of this either, but uh, it is as many of us here know. So as teachers and scholars, we should make time for making music. Uh, that's not to say if you haven't been to tell you off. I just feel like it's very important and it's easy not to. I was, um, I was speaking with uh, my doctoral supervisor, Lucy Green, the other day, and she was saying that she, there was a 10-year period where she'd not felt she'd been able to make music. And then she went back to it after 10 years and, you know, was sort of elated to have got back to it, but also just kind of had this sort of I'd, I'd sort of weight of having not done any music for 10 years and wish she'd managed to make the time because it's just so important. And I think people who make music understand how important it is to us to do this. Um, one second. Oh, yeah, and uh, we have a band practice tonight because I like to make music. Um, so onto this self-love business uh, that I was unsure about. Um, Jesus is a popular chap in many quarters, and he has said that we should love your neighbor as yourself. And I guess when I grew up uh, in the, the Anglican church, we focused less on the as yourself part. That was kind of, no one was supposed to love themselves. It was really about helping others, which I'm also for. But um, it's just helped me to think about maybe the as yourself part as an important place to start. Um, to back him up, 
Um, Henry Frankfurt says that coming to love oneself is the deepest and most essential and by no means the most readily attainable achievement of a serious and successful life. Um, I'm not sure whether my life is serious or successful. Uh, it feels very successful in many ways because it's still going on. Um, serious, I don't know. Maybe I joke too much. But anyway, I found this very, um, I found this reassuring actually. And uh, yeah, it's just exciting to kind of find people who back up what you're thinking and prompt you to think differently, I think, you know. So that's all I have. Um, Apart from eight seconds of my new band music. Thank you very much.